Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Well, we're talking about, you know, victorious overcoming faith. And we're on point number uh, seven, I believe. Our foundational text for this scripture is our church motto. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. First points have been recognize the source of your problem, the devil. Recognize the source of your answer, Jesus. Be sure the promises of God cover the things you ask for. In other words, have, other words, have scripture to found and base your faith upon. And actually, if you don't, there's not really faith. Okay? Fred Price did a sermon series a number of years ago. I believe he did it in 1979. I believe it may have been the first time he taught it. At Ra- and he taught it at Raymond. It took him two weeks. He came to Raymond for two weeks and taught Faith, Foolishness, or Presumptions. Many of you have that book by Dr. Frederick K.C., Knowing Christ, Price. All right. Well, they recorded it. Every year after that, for a number of years, the first thing the student body did when they got there was watched. Dr. Frederick Casey Price on video teaching, is it faith, foolishness, or presumption? Okay? Well, it's, it's not faith if it's not based in the Bible. So you could be presuming on the things of God because, you're not, because there's no scripture, or you could be uh, foolish. I'm believing for my neighbor's wife. That's foolishness, along with a few other things. Okay? All right. Uh, be sure you're not living in sin. The next point. We went over that. We don't have to spend a lot of time on that. You've heard, you've heard enough of that. Nobody else wants to hear any more of it. Well, if you don't, need to hear, don't want to hear any more of it, go back and listen to it again. You need it. All right. Uh, next was uh, this, um, not, let no doubt in your life. Next was sincerely desire, desire the benefit. Last Sunday night we covered ask God in faith, nothing wavering. Uh, he that wavereth is, is, is like the waves of the sea, tossed to and fro. Amen. So this morning... Turn, if you will, to the second book of Corinthians, chapter 10, looking at verse 4. Uh, we have not gotten here yet. How many were here Wednesday night? Paul got out of Ephesus and got to Macedonia. One verse, and we're back in 2 Corinthians. It took us, you know, I don't know, eight weeks or whatever to get through 1 Corinthians. He said, well, we're going to go get out of 1 Corinthians. We'll get Paul out of Ephesus. We did. We read the first verse of the, of, of the uh, 20th chapter or 19th chapter. I forget, 19th or 20th. I forgot which it is right now off the top of my head. And got into Macedonia and got into 2 Corinthians. So we're in 2 Corinthians. Paul's stuck in Macedonia now. Hallelujah. At least he moved. Amen? Hallelujah. And, um, and but 2 Corinthians is going much faster. I think we got through chapter 7 this past Wednesday night. So um, it's just the cadence and, the t- and everything of that particular book is not the same as 1 Corinthians. So it's moving along a little faster. Do not tolerate a thought to the contrary. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 We'll just start in verse 1. Now I, Paul, beseech myself, beseech you in the, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. Now, if you've been with us on Wednesday nights, we've been talking about Paul and, and, and the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth was a problem church for him. We, we believe uh, from some internal evidence there's possibly at least four letters he wrote to the church at Corinth. We have two, and we refer to those as first and second, but there's obviously, according to 1 Corinthians, a letter he wrote before 1 Corinthians, because in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, he talks about he wrote an epistle to them uh, and told them some stuff. Uh, and then there's evidence here in 2 Corinthians that there may have been one in between 1 and 2. So possibly up to four letters uh, he wrote, and um, we only have the record of two. And notice here he says, I, I, in presence I am base among you. They did not like Paul coming and doing some of the things he was doing. They, they, they were people coming in saying, who does he think he is, basically? And he says, you know, but absent, I'm bold towards you. He says, now, when I'm with you, you, you may do this, but I'm right. I'm being bold with you, okay? I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Now, the people were accusing him of just, you know, well, you just think you're somebody, you're walking in the flesh, uh, you know, and, and kind of this whole new era mantra, who do you think you are to tell me what to do, you know? You know, you're not the, you know, have, have kids say, you're not the boss of me. Mm. 
put something on you. Chow that. <laughs> put a Medea on you. <laughs> Amen. I, I'm a little ba- Dick. I'm a little bassy up here. I mean, I'm hearing a lot of bass out of my mic. Y'all hearing it? I, I'm hearing it. All right. Um, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war. Now, what he's saying is, what he's basically saying when he says we walk in the flesh, he's not saying we walk, we walk in the flesh and we, we live by the flesh. He's saying we live in a body. We're in a body. Okay, we're fit. We, have a, we have a physical body. But, but then, so, let me say it this way. Though we have a physical body, we don't war with that body. <coughs> Amen. Amen? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of the anointed one and his anointing. Amen. And having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, we, can, we cannot receive a thought to the contrary of our faith. Amen. Notice here, it says to bring every thought and, and imagination into subjection. I'm, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase this a little bit. But into subjection to Christ, to the anointing one and his anointing. You, what we think, let's see, our thought processes, our thought process cannot be what governs us. Our heart must be what governs us. And the renewing of our mind, we'll get to Romans 12 here in a minute. We do not do what we do the way the world does it. When you're living by faith, it's not how the world does it. It's how does the Bible say do it. Amen. Amen. And when you know, and, and you, so you'll, you'll encounter things in life, and you're going along, and here the Bible says, you know, you know the, the, we're to cast down thoughts and imaginations and high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Amen. So we're to do what the Word says. And that is when thoughts come contrary to what the word says, we cast them down. We bring them in subjection to the anointed one and his anointing. And they must yield and submit to that anointing and encounter the destructive power, I mean, yes, the destructive power of the anointing on ungodliness. Things that are contrary to wholesome doctrine. And so in the lifestyle of faith, if you're going to have a victorious lifestyle of faith, you're going to have to submit imaginations, and here's an imagination. I'm going to die before my time. That is an imagination that needs to be brought in subjection to the anointed one and his anointing for it to destroy its power in your life. Amen. Well, how do you know, well, well, how do you know that that's destructive? Because the Bible says, with long life will he satisfy me and show me his salvation. So then when I, I'm being told it's going to get cut short, then that's contrary to what the Word says because the Word says that I have long life and he's going to show me his salvation. Then when I take the imagination or the th- thought that says you're going to die young, you're not going to fulfill your course, and I bring it into obedience to the anointed one and his yoke-destroying, burden-removing power and say, no, you do not have the ascendancy in my thought process. You are subject to the yoke-destroying, burden-removing power of Christ, and it will destroy you its ability to function in your life. Amen. 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 Somebody shout glory. Glory. And so we cannot allow the thoughts to the contrary to what the Word says. You have to govern that. And they will come. I bind every negative thought from coming to me. No, 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 no. You can't bind it from coming to you. It's coming to you. When it gets there, you take it and subject it to the authority of the anointed one and his anointing. You capture it, and then you subject it to the authority of Christ, whose yoke, destroying, burden, moving power will render it ineffective. Amen. You can't stop them from coming. That's just like the people used to fly around in airplanes and get in helicopters and put on army fatigues and go up and bind the ruling spirits over the city and tell them they couldn't function. They were still functioning. You can't stop. You know, remember what the demon said to Jesus? Have you come to t- torment us before the time? Before the time. Before, well, Adam's lease. If you could have bound every ruling spirit over every city and took care of everything, Jesus would have already done it when he was here on the earth. 
Isn't it amazing we try to do stuff that Jesus wouldn't do? Come on now. Jesus didn't do that. No. Now when the devil came, he just used the word on him. See, you can't confess the devil will never come and try to do something to you. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that's the opposite. It said put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. The evil day is going to come. There's going to be a visitation of the enemy against your life. But the Bible's already told you what to do. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in that day. Equip yourself with the things of the Spirit. Equip yourself with the armor of God. Take the word of God. Be ready. And when he shows up, you put a hurting on him. Just like Jesus did. Jesus didn't go, uh, you're not here, devil. <laughs> no, he said it's written. See, this, this, is where we, this is the difference between faith and, and, and getting to a place where we're not, we're not really being affected because we're saying things the Bible doesn't teach us to say. So let's confess what the Word says. Let's bring every thought. When those thoughts come, and I'm going to tell you, folks, when you're facing something, those thoughts come, you're going to die early. Well, no, no, no. Now, now listen, you're not going to be able to capture that thought unless you know what the Word says. Find out what the Word says and then use the Word against it. No! God promised me long life, he'll, he'll satisfy me. And you said, I'm going to die early. I capture you in Jesus' name. I bring you into captivity. You're subjected to the authority of Christ. You have no power over me because it's written. With long life, I'll satisfy you and show you my salvation. Amen. See, now, now we're not what? We're not warring after the flesh. We're not war warring with human reasonings. We're not warring with, with uh, impotent weapons. We're warring with that which is powerful and that which will make it happen, glory to God, the word of God. What Jesus used. Notice, let, let run over me, if you will, before we go to Romans, the, sixth, the 12th chapter. Run over to Ephesians chapter 6, please. Let's just drop in on, on Paul over in Ephesus, or writing to Ephesus. He's not at Ephesus when he writes Ephesians. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, 610, and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Don't, you can't confess that you're not going to fight the devil. Hello? See, I remember back, back in my heyday. See, now, look, if you think confession is something, you should have seen it back in the late 70s. I mean, everybody had a confession beeper, and they used it on everybody but themselves. If you made a dagger in confession, they jumped on you, and, I mean, four people came out and started casting bad confession devils out of you. I mean, they'd say, I wouldn't say that if I were you. You know, you, I mean, they'd just start, I mean, they'd just jump all over you. And they never used it on themselves. Now, Brother Bill's back there giving me this. Because he was the ring leader. No, <laughs> I think me and Brother Bill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what he used to say. <laughs> I wouldn't say that if I were you. I was as bad as any of them. All right. Now you behave yourself. Janie walked, one time, Janie walked off from me while I was rebuking a sinner for telling me good luck. I don't believe in luck. That's the root word of Lucifer. I am blessed. And I turned around and she was gone. Everybody say, young and really dumb. I wasn't just young and dumb. I was young and really dumb. I, yeah, I was, somebody, you know, they, they, that's all I got on the community college with, and they saw me, and they were asking what I was doing. Oh, I got saved. I'm in the ministry. I'm going to do this. And they said, well, you know, and you could tell because they're sitting there, you know, looking at you like, oh, God, he's one of them. They said, well, well good luck. Luck, I don't believe in luck. Luck's the root, 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 root word of Lucifer. I'm blessed. God blesses me. Hallelujah. No wife. Actually, no girlfriend. It was, we weren't even married. She just disappeared. And at five foot two, it don't take a whole lot to do that. You just duck and you're gone. Hallelujah. 
See these little marks on my hands? These are, these are fingernail imprints. She takes her hand. She takes her, that's why she has those long fingernails. It's like a cattle prod. She uses it only. <laughs> Moving them right along. And where, where was I? Wrestle not against flesh and blood. There you go. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There is a spiritual battle, folks. And we don't, and the Bible says we're not, we're, we're not, uh, uh, one place says we're not ignorant of his devices. It says we're to stand against the wiles of the devil. Then he goes on and says this, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand. Philip says, you know, having fought the battle till the end, remain on the battlefield ready to do battle again. His early version, I don't, I don't think the newer version has it that way, but the, one of the early ones before he cleaned it up. All right, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wickedness. See, they're coming. I said the darts are coming, or the fiery missiles are coming. You take your faith and you, and you quench them. Amen. Amen? They're going to come. Yeah. Don't be surprised when they come. Just know what to do when they come. Take the shield of faith and quench them. Amen? Wherewith you should be able to quench all the fire darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Notice every last one of them are, are defensive except the last one. The word of God is your offensive weapon. And we're not going to do a less teaching on the, on, the, on the armor of God this morning. But all those other weapons are defensive in nature. But there is one weapon you have that is an offensive weapon. It is God's word. And that is when those things come and the, and the attacks of the enemy come. You do just like Jesus did. It is written. It is written. It is written. It is written. Why? Because when you speak the word, that has the authority. Look over, if you will, into um, Second Corinthians chapter 4. Look down here in verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, for the thing, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. Now, it don't take a whole lot to figure out, even if you don't have a Greek concordance or a Greek th uh, degree, what temporal means. What does it mean? Temporary. Literally, subject to change. But the things which are not seen <coughs> are eternal. There are two things we are told in the Bible that are eternal. God. What's the other thing? His word. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word. Now, how long is forever? forever? Eternally. It's forever. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Now, the things which you've seen, what are the things which you've seen? The circumstances of life. The thing the enemy brings against you. The, 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 uh, the thoughts about how bad it's going to be. All of that are temporal things. But there is something that is eternal and settled in heaven called the Word of God. Everybody say the Word of God. So, if, go to Isaiah chapter 55. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. Can I say something? If it doesn't line up with the way God does it, you ain't doing it right. If you're not saying it, believing it, thinking it the way God says it, doesn't, it, thinks it, you ain't doing it right. Hello? My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And ways are higher than your ways. For as the rain comes down from heaven and the snow from heaven returns not thither, thither, just just like that. Isn't that an amazing word, thither? Okay. But watereth the earth and maketh it to bring forth in bud, 
that I may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be. Hello. That goeth forth out of my mouth. Everybody underline, it shall not. Underline it. Take it. Get out of it. I don't want to write my Bible. Get rid of that one. Go to our bookstore. We got some you can write in. All right? We'll say you a pen to write in it with. All right? It shall not do what? Return to me void. The word void is tohu. Same word used in Genesis where it says, and the earth was without, with a void and without form. Okay? Listen, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Now, remember 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18 says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen, because the things which are seen are the things which are seen are temporal, meaning subject to change, temporary, subject to change. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, we've, we've established that there's two things that are eternal, God and his word. What do we use? This book of the law, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you'll meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that's written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success, or as one margin translation says, deal wisely in the affairs of life. See, when you're saying what the Word says and meditating on what the Word says, it'll govern how you think and make you do right things because you'll be wise in how you conduct yourself. Hello, you don't need a 65-point seminar on how to be, make good decisions if you'll just feed on the Word enough. Amen. Amen. Hello, I know I, I taught a number of years ago a sermon called Decisions, 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 and it always comes back to the same thing. Renew your mind to the Word of God, you'll make good decisions. Amen. You'll think right. How many know this? Your head's messed up until it gets renewed. How many, got a, how many have ever had a messed up head? Let me tell you this. Can I say this without, in all kindness and love? Part of it's still messed up. You need more renewing. We all do. We need to keep renewing and keep renewing. All right. So God says, now, now so, so if we take 2 Corinthians 4, we're not going to look at the things which we see. Now, we don't deny them. We're just going to look at something of a greater power. How many when you get on an airplane start worrying about gravity? No, when you get on an airplane, you're thinking about the law. You're really thinking about the you know, We're going to take off. What are you talking about? You're looking at the thing, amen, that's going to supersede the law of gravity. <coughs> the law of thrust and lift. Amen? Are you here? You're going home. And even under the circumstance of the pull of gravity, it will, it will work in a way that allows you to go where you want to go flying and stay in the air. Even though gravity is still pulling on you, it, it supersedes in a way that it then, it then uses gravity to its own good. Amen? And the, that's why God says that, that all things will work together for our good. Now look, not that the bad thing he sent it, but when you walk with him, and he starts bringing you out. He'll, he'll, he'll go right in the middle of a bad circumstance. He'll turn you into a place where you can, you can go and supersede that with his laws of love and, and re restoration and power and love. I mean, all kinds of things God can do work in our life. So we're not going to look at the things which are seen. So don't look at the thing which is seen. Say it. I'm not going to look at the thing which is seen. What do you mean by that? I'm not going to let it govern how I act. I'm not going to deny it. I'm just not going to let it govern how I act. Now, I, I know I'm going to use a scripture somewhere else, but I've got to go there. Hold your place in Isaiah 55. I am running all over the place because the Holy Ghost is dragging me here and there. I'm going hither and thither. <laughs> Amen. I feel like the Jordan River this morning. Yeah, we didn't know which way to go. It went hither and thither all the time. Prophet comes by and he's probably going, which way, hither or thither? 
Glory to God. Hallelujah. I got I to find it. Just hold on with me. It's, it's, uh, I'm all on so many places this morning. Glory to God. Romans chapter 4. Looking down. Look at verse 16. I'm, I'm going to read this in, in the next one. We'll just have our next couple, couple uh, points. But just hold on. Therefore, it is of grace that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, that is, mean natural seed, but that also which is of the faith of Abraham, the supernatural seed, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee the father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. He did not call those things which be as though they were not. There's a difference. God looks in the middle of a circumstance and declares the end instead of denying the present. He speaks the end, but does not deny the present. Amen. And that's exactly what happened here. Who, who, who calls things which be not as though they were. We do not confess. I'm not sick. That's denying what it is. No, what do we declare? I am the healed of the Lord in Jesus' name. And you can give your scriptures at this point. What are you doing? You're calling which is not. You're speaking the end in the middle of a present opposition. Hallelujah. We have the power to speak the end result in the midst of contradictory uh, circumstances of the present. Here, here's what Weymouth says. Thus in the sight of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead, I love, the, I love this phrase, and makes reference to things that do not exist as though they did. Yeah. Woo, glory to God. How did he do that? You're not Abe anymore, you're Abraham. Amen. You're now the father of a multitude. I ain't got no babies. I'm calling... He did not, you know, so God did not say, you're not impotent. God said, you're the father of many nations. Now, King James, I don't know, I, I, I'm thinking the translators are trying to bring this point across because of the whatever, but about any other translation you pick up is going to kind of go this direction I'm about to read to you. And, and I don't think the King James translators were trying to, I think what they were trying to do is articulate it. When you do a word for word, sometimes it's hard. And you have to say things in a certain way to try to get the point across. And maybe in their, in their, in their, in their thought process. And I understand the Brits think different than we do. They're all messed up now. We love our Brits. All right? But, you know, their, their language structure and stuff, even, even though it's English, you know, when you go to England and pick up a menu, they have a British flag and they have an American flag. Because we don't speak English, we speak American. Over there, we speak American. And pretty much anywhere in Europe, we don't speak English, we speak American. Because there are cultural, it's just like the, the Canadian French speak a different French than the, than, than the Parisians. Okay? And of course, the, the Paris the people in France think that the French, the French Canadians speak all messed up. Because that's, you know, whatever. Where was it? Oh. And so, he makes reference to things that do not exist as though they did. Abraham is the forefather of us all. So God looked at that circumstance and spoke a higher word. Everybody say a higher word. A higher word. Why? Because there's a higher word that is eternal that will supersede the lower word which is subject to change. Come on now. Amen. So you can look at your circumstance and you don't go, I'm not, a, I'm not in debt. There's an old song, I believe it was about Three Dog Night. Liar, liar. Somebody remember that song? Yeah, was that Three Dog Night? It was Three Dog Night, Grassroots, one of those guys that had that kind of group. He wasn't the guess who, so I think, I think it was Three Dog Night. Why did they call him Three Dog Night? I don't know, but they sang about Jeremiah the Bullfrog. So they were, they were into animals. Y'all remember that? Jeremiah was a bullfrog. Anyway, I'm sorry. Was a good friend of mine. All right. Who's singing about the frog? The dogs. And they're singing at night. I don't know. All right, I'm sorry. 
Nathan. So we have the Word of God telling us that we're not going to look at or be governed by the things which we see. Let me go ahead and read this now. <coughs> and uh, he goes on here and says this, being not, and, and who against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, uh, listen to this, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. The word of God calls him to believe, and, and one, one translation says, under utterly hopeless circumstances, he hopefully believed. And what were the other circumstances? His wife is 90 or 89. And I have preached on prune wound Sarah before. Her wounds dried up like a prune. She ain't going to have no young'uns. She's 90, 89 years old. Ceased to be with her after the manner of women. That's what the Bible says. And under utterly hopeless God came in and said, she's going to have a baby. And you know what she did? She laughed, and it was not the laughter of joy. That man in the other room has lost his head. Hello? She probably, went and said, like, she probably heard that and went, oh, no, he didn't. <laughs> Amen. Oh, no, he didn't say that. And, and, and then the Lord looks at Abraham and says, your, why did your wife laugh? She goes, I didn't laugh. I mean, can you imagine mocking the word of God and lying about it in the same breath? But the Bible says Abraham, and that utterly, how many, how many have, have, have experienced or are experiencing utterly hopeless circumstances? Let me say this. The utterly hopelessness is the world side. It's the word that the world is giving you. It is the word that the enemy is bringing your way, that your circumstance is beyond repair, that your circumstance is beyond fixing, that your circumstance, there is no hope. It is hopeless. But he hopefully believed According to the word that was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Anybody get, I just got a chill. <laughs> Hallelujah. I should have five runners. When you're facing an utterly hopeless circumstance, there is a hope that can rise according to what was spoken. Hallelujah. What was that word? So shall thy seed be. The hopelessness, hopelessness of his circumstance was there's no way. But in facing that circumstance, a word had come out of heaven from the one who had declared as the rain and the snow cometh down from heaven and returneth not thither. Amen. That goeth forth and watereth the earth that it may bring forth in bud. It shall not return to me void, but it shall prosper in the thing I sent it. Amen. I forgot what I said. I've kind of moved off of there. Hold it. I want to quote it right. I don't want to quote it. Sometimes you get running off and you misquote. It shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the thing I've sent it. Well, what, what did he please? What he said. I said, it, what did he please? What he said. What he said is what was his pleasure. By his stripes ye were healed. The word of God was sent. What? It pleased him to send, for, he sent his word and healed them. It was his pleasure for you to be healed. It will accomplish the thing he sent it to do. What are you saying? God doesn't lie. I can hear Shambhai right now. God is not a man that he should lie. 
<laughs> Not a son of man that he should repent. Amen. I know some of y'all heard Shambot before. Back when he was younger, he had a real high voice. Got lower as he got older. Kind of like Frankie Valley, you know. He went from Sherry to Sherry. <laughs> Hallelujah. God has said that his word and his thoughts are higher than ours. And let me say that. And the devil's. Satan has a word for you today. Failure. You're not going to make it. You're going under. But God has a word. Hallelujah. He's got a word for you today. It says you're the head and not the tail. You're above only and not beneath. That you're blessed coming in and going out when you lie down, when you rise up. You're blessed and prospering everything you set your hand to. Glory to God that his eyes are running to and fro over all the earth. What's he doing? He's looking to bless you. And if we will meditate in his word day and night, if we will confess his word, say what he says, not, that's, this is so important, church. This is so important. And I've been teaching this for 30 years. We have to say what God says because that's where faith is. We are taking the higher law of the word and thoughts of God and laying them as a template over top of what the devil says. And whatever the devil says now becomes subordinate and impotent in its ability to function because you've established a higher law on it. Now that airplane, as soon as you turn the engines off, gravity takes over. You turn your faith off and unbelief will take over. You stop saying what the word says and the enemy's words will take over. It's not to put you in fear. We just got to be diligent. Amen. I said, we got to be diligent to say what the word says, to do the word. Well, that's works. No, it ain't works. It's Bible. God's going to do it for me no matter what I do. That's like saying, you know, now yesterday, um, Sorry, Cap, but yesterday I told Jane, I'm going to go to the grocery store and get some food so we can cook lunch. Um, I might get some hamburgers and dogs with hamburgers. And I, and I came, oh, I don't think I'm going to do that. I'll just come up with something. So I came back with all the stuff to make chicken cordon bleu. Eat the ba 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 ba. Pound the chicken breast out, put the ham and the Swiss cheese in them, roll them up, dip them in egg, roll them in, uh, in shake and bake. You know, put them in the oven and bake it with some Parmesan on top of it. Then you make the sour cream and mayonnaise and cream of mushroom sauce. You put all that in a ladle over top after it gets done. And then cook that some more. Have mashed potatoes and put that, that all over top of it. The cheese is run out. Glory to God. I'm just telling you about it. It's just so you can think about it. Hallelujah. I don't know why I even brought that up. Does anybody know why I was going that direction? There was a reason. Huh? You're hungry. I mean, I just lit in the house and slapped myself three times. I'm trying to remember what I was going to say. I, I was going to use that to make a point. Nah. Okay. Hallelujah. Why did I think about chicken cordon bleu? Maybe it was just so good I had to talk about it. Yeah, I did not want to rub it in. There, was a, there really was going to be a point out of that. Hallelujah. I remember it on the way home and think, oh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Hallelujah. Huh? Yeah, that's because I was going to talk about the cord in blue. He wasn't here to get any. That's why I said, sorry, Cap. All right, well, forget it. It was good cordon bleu, trust me. Huh? 
Yeah, the, the law, you know, the law of God's word working and keep maintaining that. And it becomes subordinate, yeah. Don't know. I had this thought, I was getting ready to tell and I got caught up talking about how good the cordon blue was. Oh, well, thank you, Jesus. It must not have been that important. <laughs> anyway, all right, let me, let me, let me kind of. There you go. Thank you. That is exactly what it was. <laughs> Ellie got it. Now, we all sat down out there on the deck. We had, we had a, went out there to eat. I can tell you, if I put that food down, you could have looked at it and said, man, I bet that's good. Mm, I can smell it. Oh, I know that is good, and it smells good. <sighs> anyway. <laughs> and you look at that food. Everybody else eats that food, and they're getting nourishment, and you don't ever eat it. It won't do you any good. It's there. It smells good. It looks good. And I can guarantee you one thing. It's some kind of taste good. But if you look at it and don't eat it, if you don't partake of it, there's no benefit to you. Hello? If we take the Word of God and we don't meditate in it and we don't feed on it and we don't do it, it's of no benefit to us. When you come to Faith and Victory Church, you don't come here so you can just hear the word and go out and not do it. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, what? Deceiving your own selves. If you don't do it, you're deceived. God's word says to be a doer of it. God says my word is higher than your circumstance. My word is higher than what you're dealing with. My word, and, and I sent it, understand this, every seed, remember God's word is a seed, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. God's word has genetic, and I don't know if this is a proper term, but genetic DNA in it. I don't know if plants have DNA or if they're called something else, but there are genetics to seeds. Now, we got collard seeds in our house. If I plant those, I am not going looking for tomatoes. Or maters. Or potatoes. I'm going to look for collards. Why? Every seed produces after its own kind. Amen? Amen? So when we take God's word, he says it will accomplish the thing I sent it. Amen? Prospering the thing I please and, and, and prospering the thing I sent it to do. That means that whatever his seed is, whatever that word is, that's what it's going to produce. So if I need prosperity, I speak prosperity words or seats. Now, God said it will prosper. So I now have an overlay over my life that if I'll meditate on and speak the word of God in certain arenas and not speak the circumstance or what's going on, then that will overtake because it's a higher law. What is the law? It's the law of God sowing a seed and getting a harvest or he sent his word. His word has the authority to overcome anything else. How many know in the natural, your weeds will overtake your garden? In the spirit, God's word will overtake the weeds. If you'll keep speaking the word, meditating on the word, and feeding on the word, it'll choke. I know that, you know, remember, if you study this parable of the sower, that when, if you don't watch it, the cares just will rise up and choke you. Well, you're, you're, you're focusing on the cares and not on the word. See, that's the thing. He said the cares of this world and the lust of other things will enter in. They'll choke the word. How'd they do that? Because you begin to look at those and not at the eternal. You begin to focus on it. And when you look in your garden, you see a weed this tall and your little vegetables this tall, it's easy to focus on the weed and not on the seed. Looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. We're constantly reminded to keep our eyes on him. Get our eyes off the circumstance. Get them on him. Get it off the situation. Get it on him. Not deny the situation. It's there, but get your eyes on him. Speak, say, believe, act on, teach, preach, confess the word. Because it will accomplish what God sent it to do. Can you say amen? We trust that you were blessed by the word of God and the flow of the spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at 
office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.